which being Stuart Hammerhoff, and he's going to give a breakdown of uh, Dr. Rakel's talk and with some of his own ideas thrown in as well, so it's two for the price of one. And then we're also going to have a, um, a, two, a graduate student and a postgraduate uh, student to talk a bit about default networks as well. So, so there's not, we didn't miss much. Um, it's un still unfortunate, of course, that he can't be here. But it's my pleasure now to introduce uh, the keynote speaker, um, Professor Robert Schulman. And professor, he's a sterling professor emeritus uh, of molecular biophysics and biochemistry at Yale University. Uh, he's been a leader in the application of NMR methods to biochemical and biomedical problems for five decades. Um, he holds bachelor's and PhD degrees from Columbia University and has been a faculty member at Yale since 1979. Well, I very appreciate uh, having been invited to discuss people who are interested in the state of consciousness. And I am particularly pleased uh, with the title of the conference, which is uh, Toward a Science of Consciousness, because toward indicates uh, that we're not there, but that it's an ongoing movement, and science is what I'm going to try to talk to you about today. So, uh, the uh, title of my talk is uh, Baseline Brain Energy Supports the State of Consciousness. It is work done, uh, summarizes work done over the past uh, several decades, up to today, uh, with my colleagues, Professors Haida and Rothman at Yale and uh, work done at the Magnetic Resonance Research Center there. The origins of <coughs> our field uh, and my talk and our work uh, is that we can go back and start with the 17th century where Descartes and Galileo developed empirical physical science to study matter and energy. And both accepted that the subjective, uh, immaterial mind, defined by thoughts, feelings, or soul, was inaccessible to physical studies of energy and work. And that uh, allowed them to proceed with the development of physical science through the years and their successes to, to today. In a, a quite a revolutionary sense, uh, modern neuroscience uh, has decided that uh, that barrier can be crossed and uh, one can use physical methods to study something about the mental processes uh, of uh, the human when he thinks or feels. Now, energy metabolism has been very useful in human functions, particularly from the great work of the physiologists of the uh, 19th century von Helmholtz and Claude Bernard. And from, from there, <laughs> the straightforward development of molecular biology and biochemistry uh, has continued on the basis of studying the energy of reactions, the rates of reactions, and in skeletal muscle, heart, and other organs, physiologists have shown how the energy is used to support function and behavior. For example, in muscle, glucose oxidation supports the mechanical work needed for lifting for human functions or work done, moving a, a, a mass through a certain force, force potential uh, and through a certain distance <clears throat> needed for human function, such as lifting. Now, our recent brain research is explaining the relations between energy and work, and as we shall see, is providing insights into the support of human behavior by brain energy and work. So that's the connection I'm intending to make today between the brain activities in terms of the energy and work that they do uh, and uh, human uh, behavior, which is uh, behavior which is observable. Not all behavior is observable. So by, uh, by the 1970s, uh, neurophysiologists such as Bosiesio, Ketty, and Schmidt had measured brain energy. They had consolidated earlier understanding that the brain consumed about 20% of the body's energy and that this energy was produced by the oxidation of glucose. So it was a perfectly straightforward uh, uh, consumption of energy, uh, <coughs> production consumption of energy, 
by the brain, very similar to that by the muscle, only actually more, more, more readily measured than by, in the muscle. Because you, however, <coughs> the question rose as to what the brain energy was doing. Uh, it, it rises all over the place. It arises on the, uh, in the, the funny pages of the newspapers and in all sorts of speculations. And uh, it is part of the great sort of magic and mystery surrounding brain. That people were saying, well, what percentage of brain energy supports firing? Uh, and the dedication of brain energy consumption to the work of neuronal firing was questioned. Not very often, but when it was questioned in, in some loose calculations, it was eagerly uh, awaited by the world because of the concerns about the brain isn't going to be like the liver or the heart or the muscle, something that we can understand by physical measurements and theories. Extrapolations by Otto Kreuzfeld, an eminent neurophysiologist from the <laughs> great axon of the squid, led to the belief that less than 1% of oxidative energy is used for the work of neuronal firing. And so it stood for a while, and it opened the pathway for psychological studies of brain function instead of the traditional kinds of studies uh, that physics has made throughout the years of the other organs and other living processes. So if brain energy were not used to support the cerebral work of neuronal firing as claimed by Kreutzfeld, then fundamental physical studies of energy and work could not explain brain function. Therefore, the opening existed for psychological methods and assumptions which came to dominate brain imaging studies. <laughs> However, as I shall show you, as we shall see, our brain research going back <laughs> to the early 90s in fact, the late 80s, uh, our recent brain research shows that brain energy efficiently supports the neuronal work of firing and provides insights into neuronal support of behavior once we understand that it has being used, the energy is being used to do the work of neuronal firing. The relations between energy and work, I think you're all familiar. Physics is the study of energy and matter, and energy is, <laughs> is the ability to do work. And since the 1990s, non-invasive methods, PET, fMRI, C13, MRS, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, which is what I shall emphasize a bit today, as well as oxygen 17 measurements and, and P31 measurements, all non-invasive measurements of uh, brain activities, uh, actual physical measurements of brain activities, have measured the metabolic pathways generating brain energy and its coupling to work of neuronal firing, and these recent results have shown that almost all the neuronal energy supports the work of neuronal firing in contrast to the earlier proposal of something like less than 1%. <coughs> so the first question of the two that I will address today is how do we measure brain energy consumption and its relation to the work of neuronal firing, while the second question indicated in a shaded bottom two lines, is how does the work of neuronal firing support human functions and behaviors? But to the first question, how do we measure brain energy consumption and its relation to the work? The rate of cerebral energy production is measured by the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. <coughs> the brain is supported by the work done by, in the, by the energy produced by the oxidation of glucose. Brain work being measured is neuronal firing and its coupled processes when the firing occurs of neurotransmitter cycling, and the neurotransmitter that I'm going to be discussing preeminently today is the neurotransmitter glutamate. And it, but the, these processes of neurotransmitter cycling, which you call recycle, chemical reactions, and ion repumping, repumping the sodium and potassium after the action potential, this is, this is the, these are the associated works uh, that are coupled to the firing. Now, synapses, <coughs> where neurons meet and pass information to, forward, uh, the glutamate GABA synapses account for about 90% of neuronal activity in cerebral cortex. Glutamate is the most... Uh, eminent, most uh, dominant uh, neurotransmitter 
Uh, it is not, uh, doesn't have quite the uh, uh, excitement of all these uh, little neurotransmitters like dopamine and, and so on, but uh, it's the hev it does the heavy work, the heavy work of actually sending uh, information down pathways. And uh, a, a, a view of this, uh, of a glutamate synapse, uh, is here with the pre <coughs> presynaptic neuron with glutamate encapsulated in vesicles. Upon firing or the action potential, these vesicles go to the surface, release all oh, 10,000 or so molecules of glutamate. Glutamate, you know, is an amino acid, small molecule, about uh, 10 or 12 atoms in it. And the glutamate drifts across, <coughs> diffuses across the, the cleft, where it is recognized by receptors in the postsynaptic neuron, but it's not taken up by uh, the postsynaptic. Rather, it diffuses out of the cleft, where it is taken up by glia, and there it go enters the glia by going down a sodium gradient, coupled to sodium, and brings sodium back down in. And it is then chemically, with the use of ATP and ammonia, and an enzyme, converted to glutamine. Glutamine is released back into the cleft, and then converted back to glutamate, and eventually repackaged with the help of some energy, re repackaged into the vesicles. So the neurotransmitter is cleared, <coughs> and it has to be within uh, 10 milliseconds or so, so as to ready the synapse for the next action potential, which it's able to co cover. So in the process, then, of glucose and oxygen coming into the capillaries, it's oxidized, <coughs> uh, here I show it being oxidized in the uh, neurons, making a lot of ATP, 30-odd ATP. And uh, the uh, glutamate is on the pathway to making ATP. It's on the side of the Krebs cycle, for those of you who are uh, familiar with it, on the side of alpha-KG. But it measures the flow down to ATP. So by measuring the flow from glucose into glutamate, we are measuring the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption. And then, by measuring the flow from glutamate as a precursor to glutamine, we are measuring the cycling, V-cycle, of the neurotransmitter. So I will show you how, in the same experiment, where we start with C13-labeled glucose, C13-labeled glucose, we follow the flow first into glutamate, and then glutamate acting as a precursor of the glutamine, we see subsequently the, the label appearing in glutamine. So energy consumption, <coughs> glucose oxidation, and glutamate-glutamine cycling are, are going to be studied together. Energy consumption, CMRO2 in vivo, can be measured by C13 magnetic resonance spectroscopy, MRS, which as I've sketched here, and I'll show you a bit more of a bit of, det of data in a moment, which follows the oxidation of C13 enriched glucose through glutamate to eventually to ATP. The work of neuronal firing, coupled to V-cycle, the rate of glutamate neurotransmitter release and cycling, is followed in the same C13 MRS experiment. So C13 <coughs> MRS uniquely measures CMRO2 and V cycling at the same, uh, in the same experiment. And here's a, a, a Robin de Graff's uh, uh, schematic of it. Here we start with labeled glucose in blue at the top in the blood. And then it's labeled because normally C13, the natural abundance, is 1.1%. But you can chemically uh, enrich uh, a carbon of glucose up to 99% or so. So you start with labeling that <coughs> glucose. And then you'll be able to, with use it, doing C13 NMR, just like you do in uh, organic chemistry labs, <coughs> you can follow the flow as the, it first appears in the glutamate pool and continues on its way around the TCA cycle and on its way down to form ATP. But then, having <coughs> labeled the having labeled the glutamate pool, the uh, neurotransmitter release of the glutamate that I schematically showed you a moment ago is, is released, drifts across the, the gap, 
is picked up by the glia, converted to glutamine, and so on, and then recycled. So the flow from the glutamate to glutamine can be followed by the appearance of this blue label, first in the C13 label, first in the glut glutamate pool, and second in the glutamine, uh, subsequently in the glutamine. And uh, these are the only really raw data I'll show you. But uh, what you see here <laughs> is that if you start off with C13 label glucose and do C13 magnetic resonance spectroscopy, how you can follow glucose oxidation and the glutamate-glutamine cycling. At first, after a few minutes, the label appears in glutamate carbon-4, and it builds up and eventually levels off. And the plot of that is seen here. It builds up and levels off in time. Uh, but soon after that, <laughs> a few minutes, uh, the a label begins to appear in the glutamine carbon-4 peak, which is distinct, and these are st uh, st uh, studies of the human brain, and then uh, eventually builds up, and here's the time course of that. And as you can see, the glutamine time course is slower than the glutamate. The glutamate labels first, and soon after, the glutamine labels. And <coughs> by taking these data and converting them into rates, we get the rate of neuronal glucose oxidation versus the rate of the cycling, glutamate-glutamine cycling. These experiments were done on the rat. The human data is one point in here, too. But we don't, we, the reason <coughs> we show you, I'm showing you rat data is that <coughs> the, uh, we show you the neuronal glucose oxidation rate versus the cycling at different stages of anesthesia from uh, the awake resting state all the way down to the flat AEG where there's no firing anymore. And then if you look here at the uh, energy uh, oxidation being consumed at a, a point corresponding to the awake resting state, you see that about 80, 85% of the energy is used for the neuronal signaling. When there's no signaling, only about 15% of the energy is used. So that as the signaling goes up, as the cycle, uh, cycling of the neurotransmitter increases and the energy increases, we see a one-to-one -one slope actually between them. And so that when we look at the wake rat or human, we see that and measure the energy that is being consumed or measure the cycling, we see that 85% or so of the energy is being used for neuronal activity when the uh, 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 person is uh, not just resting and lying there. And the, so that is just summarizing that approximately 80% of the neuronal energy by consumption at rest is devoted to the support of neuronal work versus the uh, earlier suggestion and, and incorrect calculations uh, which, which by Kurtzfeld, which suggested less than 1%. So now, we can use physical measurements of brain energy from C13 MRS or calibrated fMRI or PET measurements to measure neuronal work. <clears throat> and these measurements provide the high degree of reliability uh, of uh, physical measurements in all those methods. So now, uh, consider uh, incremental uh, uh, firing, incremental signals of the brain uh, in the popular uh, bold fMRI uh, kind of experiment. And these neuroimaging experiments, uh, fMRI bold or, or PET, originally PET measurements, generally measure the difference, difference signal between two conditions, one with and one without a particular stimulation. And the incremental signal is interpreted as representing and localizing the brain activity responsible for that particular stimulation which shows the input of the psychological uh, interpretations because psychological interpretations are used to decide that this is memory that's taking place, that task, or, or this is intention, or this is uh, long-term memory, say. So the incremental signal that's observed <laughs> in a bold measurement, or fMRI measurement, but can be calibrated, though, and convert it into the same energy units as, base, as the baseline. I've been talking about energy of the baseline. And uh, the expression, you, you don't have to worry about the details of it, but this, is, this comes from uh, Ogawa and uh, uh, Ugabil in their early formulation of the bold, and it has been uh, uh, successful in explaining uh, bold signals ever since. 
And the important point is that uh, the, we measure <laughs> the bold signal, delta S over S. That's a measurement indicated by the red arrow. And we can, in the same experiment, using uh, very similar uh, imaging methods, well, well developed, measure the fractional increase in the blood flow. And from the, from the blood flow, we have a, a very good measure of the uh, change in blood volume, CBF. The only unknown, then, here is the delta CMRO2, the change in uh, energy uh, uh, oxidation, the fractional change there. So by measuring the bold and measuring the uh, blood flow in the same time, the same experiment, we end up with the increment of CMRO2, which is uh, represented by the bold signal in a uh, kind of differencing experiment that I've mentioned. So delta CMRO2 is at most 20% of the total energy, the baseline energy. Uh, th that 20% is in the primary sensory cortex of visual or somatosensory. And for cognitive tasks, it's less than 1% 1, 1 or less. So that <coughs> interpretations of functional imaging are almost always based on the small incremental energies, neglecting the larger total baseline energies. And here I plotted the same uh, plot of <coughs> neuronal glucose oxidation versus glutamate glutamate cycling, the same plot for the uh, rat mainly as before, and shown you that how at, at rest there's a small incremental energy, but flashing red-blue, which is the amount of energy that is uh, uh, responsible for the, <coughs> caliber for the uh, bold measurement when you calibrate it, as I've indicated a moment ago, by simultaneously measuring the blood flow and then converting the bold signal to energy. And this we uh, po uh, pointed out very, very clearly, Doug Rothman and I, in, interpreting, uh, in an article interpreting functional imaging studies in terms of neurotransmitter cycling. And the quote uh, from the end of the abstract was, measurements of the neurotransmitter cycling flux at rest in functional imaging experiments suggest that performing cognitive tasks and sensory stimulations increases neurotransmitter cycling by only 10 to 20 percent, and that's for the, the intense uh, sensory stimulation. Therefore, it cannot be assumed that reference state activities are negligible, nor that they are constant during st uh, stimulation. At the same time, uh, the field was actively working on the psychological uh, descriptions of the difference between the two states, with and without a memory task or, or something like that. And the problem was, and it was recognized by Mark Rako after a while, when he saw uh, these results that we had, is that um, if you think back upon what cognitive neuroscience uh, fundamentally assumed, uh, and that was the dominant psychological interpretation, it assumed a computer-like brain which was working on representations of mental processes, of representations of the world. A computer-like brain <coughs> only uh, work, does work when it's uh, st stimulated. A computer has to be punched, information has to be punched in, has to be stimulated. So the concept that there could be negative signals, which appeared at that time, we pointed out in uh, the 98 paper and ever in many publications since, it simply means that the high baseline energy has decreased by 1% instead of increasing by something like 1% during the positive bowl signals. So when a human is in the conscious state, fMRI detects small local incremental brain energies during cognitive and sensory stimulations, and nearly all interpretations of functional imaging are based on these small incremental energies. To understand brain function, <coughs> it is necessary to include both high global baseline energies and the small local energy changes. Because what I showed you in that graph of energy increasing with neuronal uh, neurotransmitter release uh, was <coughs> that this was an absolutely global measurement. The, the amount of energy being spent in any part of the brain, any part of the cortex, is proportional to the amount of gray matter in that cortex. So, the question now we turn to the second part of the talk, and how does the work of neuronal firing support human functions or behavior? <coughs> 
So one of the perspectives of consciousness, I mean, it's shown, it's really illustrated by the diversity of uh, the, this group. Uh, you talk to anybody, uh, you see the diversity of, of interest and in, in conceptualization of mental processes. But we're accustomed to properties of the state of consciousness being defined by psychologists, certainly by philosophers, linguists, novelists, when they write about people <coughs> uh, are trying to understand uh, the intentions, the motives, the character, the nature of mental processes. Salesmen, uh, when they're selling something, are interested in what the customer is thinking. Everybody in our society has some idea about uh, mental processes, and it's, very, and it's very useful for their everyday life. Anesthesiologists, of course, uh, uh, want to know when this person is conscious, and they have a, a, a test for it that I'll go into in a moment. Same thing for neurologists. Now, as a neuroscientist, we are interested in the neural or neuronal properties of the state of consciousness. We're not interested in uh, describing it from, uh, as, well as, say, uh, as David Chalmers does, harder, solving hard or easy problems. That's a philosopher's, dare I say, game. <laughs> as neuroscientists, we're interested in things that we can observe and measure. So, <clears throat> anesthesiologists decide that a person is in the state of consciousness by her ability to respond to simple questions, an ability lost at deepening anesthesia. Uh, we, use this we use this observable behavioral response to define when a person is in the state of consciousness. This simple response is a reliable indicator of a state of the subject. Surgical decisions and many other important decisions depend upon it. We refrain from defining consciousness by psychological or philosophical criteria. We, I happily accept the usefulness of psychological insights and philosophical insights in our everyday life and our definitions of consciousness and memory and, all and such. But these uh, contingent conceptualizations of behavior uh, are, as uh, from Wittgenstein on, people have recognized very clearly, are not uh, reliable. They don't have the reliability of physical me me measurements. And in fact, the urge to find physical correlates of these uh, psychological concepts is, uh, accounts for the excitement uh, in people's field towards these new imaging methods. For us, a person is defined to be in a state of consciousness by observable behavior. We study neural and energetic properties that maintain a person in the state. I say that we get to know things and understand things in the world by understanding their properties. We know about the, the synthesis of glycogen by knowing the different steps in the pathway. We know about what water is by understanding its fluidity, by understanding its surface tension, its, com its heat capacity. We get quantum understanding of it. But we understand more and more about water as we know more and more of its properties. We don't intrinsically know uh, the properties of water. It's, that's what science gives us in other observations. We propose that the high baseline energy, which is generally discarded in neuroimaging, is a necessary property of the state of consciousness. What evidence? Well, I'm now going to give you four different experimental uh, evidences. The first is work done in a Japanese lab, but it's also similar to <coughs> many work, much work being done by PET measurements. And it shows what happens during anesthesia. And what, what this experiment shows, it's done, work done on people, is about uh, 20 different subjects. The probability of getting no response to the anesthesiologist's question, what is your name or what day is it? The probability of getting no response was very high when at high concentration of the common anesthetic sevofluorine. And at lower concentrations of the anesthetic, coming back to zero, uh, there you got to the point where there's zero probability of no response. In other words, there's a full response. And then there's a likelihood of no response as it goes into depths of anesthesia. Well, what happens to the CMRO2, or the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen or glucose consumption, during this state? We get that from wonderful PET measurements made in Finland, Kaisiol, made by Alkaya in California. And what we see is that CMRO2 increasing towards the red 
A deep anesthesia, the whole cortex is blue, red, quite uniformly. It becomes a little, little more active, to come moving towards the red uh, at a moderate uh, anesthesia, and in the awake state, it's in the yellow, showing the increases in brain energy as you become awake, or the decreases in brain energy as you, uh, go, as you go into lose the loss of the state of consciousness. And this is correlated, you see, with the response, the ability of the subject to respond, and the observable response. Now, uh, if you look at d data acquired in, uh, by Lorries in, uh, in Cambridge and, and in uh, and Cornell in New York, they're at Liège, and put together, these, these people have done wonderful experiments on this hor these horrifying uh, disorders of consciousness using PET, uh, measuring uh, oxygen or glucose, global energies. These are global energies. And this cerebral metabolism of oxygen or glucose, so the normal <coughs> awake conscious state, is set at 100. And then for <coughs> deep sleep, for general deep anesthesia, which is, I showed you already, uh, for coma, for a vegetative state, uh, um, slight responses beyond the vegetative state, neglect this point for a moment, <laughs> and for, uh, uh, for, uh, for dead, brain dead, uh, the, the, the amount of energy is very, 40-50% brain dead is down to zero. There's one outstanding example, uh, 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 and that is the horrifying state of uh, <coughs> uh, uh, where a person is aware but is unable to communicate other than by blinking eyes. And this is the locked-in state. And there, awareness persists because uh, uh, these people can, can make great sense when you can communicate with them. But, and the brain activity is given, I give you the most pessimistic measure, but between 85 and 90 odd percent of the awake state. So the only case where the subject has the awareness that we are uh, describing as the state of consciousness uh, is the case where the person has it, <coughs> but is locked in because of the inability to, uh, to, have, to make connections with the, uh, the outside world. So that uh, you can see how defining the state of consciousness, defining the state of consciousness <coughs> in terms of uh, the global energy, as saying that a high level of global energy cortical energy is needed for the person to be in the state of consciousness, it certainly is a necessary, it certainly is necessary for the person to be in the high, in the state of consciousness. Uh, it's hard to say that it's sufficient because the, all the conditions of sleep and uh, coma are not well enough described. You get into a, co a conflict. But it can say with considerable confidence that uh, the <coughs> It is sufficient to be to, ha to have lost the state of consciousness to have low brain energy. Uh, the um, you can do lots of experiments. Uh, there's a whole panoply of experiments open from here. Uh, uh, people in these doing these very difficult and timely experiments uh, do fMRI, but the, as I will show you in a moment, fMRI signals depend upon the uh, the baseline energy. So. So let's go on to other brain properties of, that the person has or the rat has in the state of consciousness. The, rat, the rat's state of consciousness is indicated by uh, the ability to, to, uh, to find its feet. That is, you hold the rat upside down when it's not anesthetized and let him go, he lands on his feet. You hold him upside down when he's anesthetized and let him go, he bangs, he lands on his head. <coughs> so, um, and the same P1 half for all common anesthetics is found for the transition between those two. I want to point out, of course, the transition is gradual, and studying the intermediates of that transition, the global energy versus behavior, is a, a completely wide open uh, field, and the, some studies have been started on that. You go through drowsiness and so on. So another observable neuronal property is the histogram of neuronal firing rates. You take the neuronal firing rates, number them, and you plot them, and multi-unit electrode measurements on the rat <coughs> or on the monkey <laughs> have been made and of an ensemble of neurons and show how the histograms, the firing of neurons, change with energy. So we have two states of energy. We have uh, a light anesthesia necessary for, uh, by the uh, regulations uh, in red and uh, a deep anesthesia in yellow. 
What we have plotted is the number of neurons, of 184 no neurons measured in 55 rats, under these, 55 rats under these conditions. And the light anesthesia, we put the electrode in, find a neuron, measure its uh, firing rate, 5 hertz or 10 or 15, and then plot the number of neurons uh, uh, firing at 5 or 10 or any here, and plot that as a histogram. And they break up into slow signaling neurons with less than about 12 or 15 hertz and rapidly signaling neurons in the high energy state. And the high energy state has a lot of rapidly signaling neurons, whereas in the low energy state, everything has fallen down to below 10 hertz uh, and the uh, uh, contours uh, of firing are shown by the, uh, the, the solid lines. So that uh, <coughs> when the same, and these are the same neurons, the same 184 neurons, so when the, neurons, uh, when the uh, rat goes to a uh, more highly activated state corresponding to the awake non-anesthetized state, or slightly anesthetized, all these neurons move over in firing. They, in they increase their firing rate. And uh, the high energy of those uh, in the awake, in the higher energy state, the high energy and the high frequency neuronal firing are inseparable. The high RSN fraction of the ensemble is a consequence of the high energy in the state of consciousness, and it causes it. There's no, there's no, that's where the energy is being spent. So that high RSN increase the power available for gamma waves of the same frequency range, about 40 hertz, which have been reported to be characteristic of the state of consciousness by Linus and by Christoph Koch. So it's generally accepted that gamma waves support intercortical signaling, signaling necessary for the person to, be, to respond. And we see high energy, high, high, high frequency firing, high gamma waves, high intercortical connections. This is beginning to sound like consciousness, isn't it? The third brain property of the state of consciousness, and another observable property, is the pattern of neuronal firing rates. What happens during stimulation? The same multi-electrode measurements of an ensemble of neurons in a voxel uh, of the uh, uh, fMRI measurement show firing patterns depend upon global energies. Uh, first of all, I'm going to show you the neuronal firing during stimulation. What happens is seen best in the, in the lower energy state. The initial <coughs> uh, unstimulated histogram is described by the dashed line. <coughs> the solid line shows the movement to higher frequencies. This is in the deep <coughs> the anesthetized state. In the lightly anesthetized state, there are small changes, but they're much smaller than these big changes. The neurons, same neurons change their firing rate uh, during stimulation. And what happens? How can I summarize those results? Well, uh, look, at, uh, look at these three different uh, typical responses. Uh, here is plotted the change in, fractional change in firing rate. And so, uh, you, met, you go through the stimulus, and th th these set of neurons don't change their firing rate, and about 30-odd uh, percent of them do that, do that. They stay unchanged. And during stimulation, oh, about a minority, 7 percent, do decrease their firing rate, whereas 60-odd percent increase their firing rate. So that during uh, the stimulation, even in the sensory cortex, as well as uh, further down, as, oh, Oh, I pushed the wrong button. <laughs> and now I'm going to have to... Ah, okay. That was, just to, that was just to startle you a bit because it's getting a little long in the talk and uh, I think we all you know, need a little, a little stimulus to get us going. But we're coming to the end because I think I'm going to get... To, you're beginning, I hope, to get the point. So, between high and low energy states, a sizable fraction of the neuronal population change their firing rates. Incremental energy, and therefore the amplitude of a different signal, measured in an fMRI experiment, between two states comes from changes in the frequencies of a large fraction of the neurons. It's not just uh, the 1% energy, it's, uh, we saw a majority of the neurons are changing their firing rate, mostly going up or down, all over. Now take a fourth property, the last property. What does the fMRI signal look like? The pattern of brain activation measured by an fMRI bowl during sensory stimulation 
is the distinctive property of the state of consciousness. It changes when you, uh, the person goes out of, or the animal goes out of the state of consciousness. How does this activation pattern change when consciousness is lost at lower energies? Well, here's, here's, uh, here's the rat again. Here uh, on top are two slices of the rat brain at uh, very high energies, and where during a four-pore stimulation, this is the somatic sensory slice, like that, a slice through the uh, somatic sensory region, you get a very strong uh, 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 response of the somatic sensory, motor region, somatic sensory two, and so on. But also, you get uh, responses further back in the brain. This is in the in the visual cortex and uh, in the hippocampus. There are all sorts of changes all over the brain, and these are changes often thrown out in imaging experiments, but they're all over the place. During uh, the awake state, and during the human in the awake state, you, get, you stimulate the human uh, by any sensory stimulus or anything, uh, cognitive, sensory, and you get activations all over the brain. On deep anesthesia, what happens is you only get a response in the, in the somatosensory, contralateral somatosensory cortex, which is where the four-pore stimulation that you introduced, that's where it enters the brain. No place else do you see anything like that. In other words, at high energies, in a state corresponding to the state of consciousness, the, act, the stimulus is felt in many different places. The fMRI response to sensory stimulation changes from widespread brain activations at high energy to a more local activation of the sensory cortex at low energy. Only the input is activated. Widespread brain responses in the high energy state are consistent with the integration of functions, that is, for example, hearing and speaking, in the state of consciousness. So, let's get on to contemporary theories. I hope that Christoph is here. I haven't seen him. Uh, no, still don't see him. Uh, Christoph Koch has, and others have searched for an understanding of consciousness in terms of neural and neuronal correlates of consciousness. Uh, many people have done these kinds of experiments, beautiful experiments. Uh, Logothetis and, and Leopold uh, did experiments uh, on binocular vision, uh, you may be familiar with. They, you present with, to the person horizontally moving lines and vertically moving lines to the two different eyes. And then you study <laughs> the response, the sensory perception responses in the sensory cortex with the subject's awareness that is, the person says, I, because your, your awareness of horizontal or vertical flick, flicks back and forth every few seconds. And when the person or the trained uh, monkey says, I see horizontal, uh, the intensity of that st stimulus in the sensory cortex is very large. Big, big, bold signal. And when the, when the attention switches to vertical, diff a different region is activated. So, these neuronal correlates of consciousness give us the sensory perception and show that it's li linked with the state of awareness or consciousness that the person is in. But the, that's the end of the connection, because beyond those, uh, where do you go beyond those sensory stimuli? NCC of sensory perceptions are identified by local methods, by fMRI, PET, and by uh, electrode probing. So local methods have been used to extend sensory <laughs> neural correlates towards awareness. And Koch has, Koch has postulated the need for NCCE, the enabling NCC, to study brain responses beyond sensory. I propose that global high baseline energy can serve as NCCE in future studies. Uh, this is a, a review in 2002, Koch, Kramen, and Reese, of uh, where those secondary or tertiary processing areas are that are activated in addition to the sensory in, in a variety of experiments with the references given there. Many more cases of this exist. And what you see is that uh, the activations <laughs> that are seen beyond the sensory that are seen beyond the sensory are All my, I, I can't do localized brain activity. I do global activity. 
so I can't find the pointer. Okay. <laughs> the uh, pointer, though, does show that in the parietal uh, area and uh, in the uh, prefrontal, you get uh, some sort of localization, but really, basically, there's a broad activation throughout the brain uh, uh, picked up by focal methods. These are mostly uh, fMRI methods. And what I'm simply proposing is that <coughs> you really do need high global energies to uh, c do the kind of work that you, uh, that you do when you're in the state of consciousness, and you lose that when you lose the energy. So in summary, a human is in the state of consciousness as defined by the ability to respond to a stimulus. It's a behavioral response. <coughs> uh, it is of va uh, value in, for uh, medical doctors when they're concerned with the state of the person, the great consequences. High total global brain energy provides necessary support of the person in this state. Doesn't have that energy, he's not in that state. fMRI and fi firing patterns reveal widespread neuronal activity activities supporting the interconnected behaviors characteristic of the state of consciousness, responding to a stimulus. The state of consciousness in this description that I've offered you and the work that we've done is being described by reliable, observable, bottom-up neuronal properties. The usual interpretation, usual interpretation of neuroimaging starts with psychological assumptions about the contents of consciousness and uses the small incremental energies to locate them. And these incremental energies, the bold energies, for example, they're small during stimulus, they're of 1% of the baseline energy, and they're, st they're equally small during resting state uh, uh, bowl signaling, about 1% of the uh, baseline. By contrast, we define a state of the person by a reliable behavioral response. The high baseline energy, widespread bold signals, and the high frequency neuronal firing are reliable properties of the state of consciousness. What next? Well, the hypothesis that high energy is needed for the interconnected brain activities supporting the state of consciousness can be tested by, uh, obviously, other ways of lowering the energy. Hypothermia, uh, they, uh, certainly we see extensions in the various disorders of consciousness. And uh, the whole intermediate state of consciousness, I've been talking about uh, conscious state of consciousness and loss of, but the whole intermediate state of the human is gra there's steps, there's a gradual spectrum there. And at each, I, you can see experiments that would test the varying behavior as you get drowsy with the global brain energy and as you get deeper into drowsiness and so on. The correlation between observable behaviors and a global energy is un, untapped. Everybody has been, <coughs> yeah, not everybody. In, if you ask a person in, in any of our fields, how does the brain work? The answer will be, well, it's a combination of local activities and global activities. Every, there's a great history of that. Um, however, uh, the availability of localized wonderful techniques like uh, fMRI and PET for localizing activity has, made it, has put the emphasis very strongly upon getting local changes, which do exist, uh, but has neglected uh, the uh, important uh, measurements of the global activations. Only if you take, take a physical physicist view of this and think of all these activations in terms of the same fundamental parameter of energy and work can you see that the increment, whether in resting bold or bold, the increment is very small. It's less than 1% or less of the total energy. And that total energy, is, it's both comes from electrical firing and it comes from chemical glucose oxidation. So the electrical chemical nature of brain activity is transformed into energy if you could take a physical view of it. And you can bring together measurements of firing and glucose oxidation and of 40 hertz and uh, high frequency energy, the energy of, of neurons. And uh, you can bring together all these parameters which have uh, their local uh, uh, hegemony where because the measurement can be done in a certain way or the concepts exist in a certain way. Put them in terms of energy and let's start thinking of this in a coherent way. And the experiments that can be done are like correlations between changes in baseline energy and observable behavior. 
can be studied, at, for example, at different levels of anesthesia. My collaborators have been uh, with me for a long time in the Yale Magnetic Resonance Research Center, uh, primarily with Doug Rothman, who runs the center now, with uh, Fameed Haida, Kevin Baugh, and Hal Blumenfeld, all, all professors in different departments there. C13 MRS studies were done by a great <coughs> English postdoc, Nicole, Nikki Simpson, who's back at Oxford, and that in 1990s, Anand Patel, Robin de Graaf, Graham Mason. And electrical studies have been done by a, a wonderful uh, <coughs> MD, PhD student, Arian Smith and Natasha Mandag, Peter Herman, and all of these in uh, later people in Meet Haida's lab, where so many of the wonderful experiments I've described are being done. And uh, then we want to thank the various funding agencies, NIS, S, uh, NSF, and Keck, particularly. And I thank you very much for your attention. We have time for maybe about one or two questions. Uh, yeah. All, all cortical. All my measurements have been cortical. I haven't measured it. All, uh, is that your question? Uh, I've only, uh, only reporting on, on cortical, but widespread cortical measurements. I think they're very important. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, you spoke about the patient experience and 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 the
psychologists, philosophers, but you didn't include anthropological fields. I especially want to know why. I'm anthropologist. Thank you. Uh, I, I could, uh, I could uh, generalize my position, which is the, the nice thing about philosophy, it gives you the opportunity to do that. Philosophically, I'm a pragmatist. I'm a, I'm a pragmatist who believes that concepts can be very useful in, and are necessary in all, in, in all fields. Uh, each field, these concepts exist because they are useful. The only question is, do they have some sort of primacy that requires anyone studying the brain to consider them first? My answer to that is no. Uh, so that uh, although the, all the concepts of any, social, in any field of social science or uh, anything else, or just everyday life, uh, they're wonderful, but uh, they're, they're not something I can do anything about. Thank you. Uh, maybe we could just take one more question, if there's any. Yeah, right. Medication other than anesthesia? Meditation. Oh, meditation. No, I, I have not done that. I, I do not know any results in that. Actually, I have not done any of those uh, PET studies. Those were, uh, I hope I attributed them properly. Thank you very much. That was great.